Welcome, everyone. I'm just waiting for it to switch over. OK, there we go. Welcome to implementing configuration profiles. Uh, if you're here, then you've made it. So, um, <coughs> so uh, there's a lot of things that we want to talk about. Um, and uh, first off, we're going to start with introductions. Uh, my name is Sergio Aviles. I'm a systems engineer for Comcast. Um, don't all thank me at once. Um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll accept, you know, it's like I will uh, accept tithings later. So, uh, and uh, this is uh, my friend Jeremy. Oh, did he come back up here? There we go. Hi, I'm Jeremy Reichman from Tamman Technologies. So, uh, we are both representing the Greater Philadelphia Mac Admin Group, uh, which is our local community of Mac admins. Um, so, Philly in the house, can I get a yo? Yo. <laughs> yo. So, um, as I said, we're doing uh, implementing configuration profiles. Um, so, really quick, uh, just go and download the videos for Greg's session earlier and Katie's session next door. And uh, thank you, State College. Good night. <laughs> So we just finished one of the biggest weeks of the year as Apple admins with all that new technology that was introduced at WWDC. So this week has been a great way to follow up on that and assemble and make sense of all the stuff we need to do to manage Apple platforms. And those WWDC surprises are classic Apple, but there's always one more thing that will amaze us. A few years ago, I stood before you and said, surely the future of device management would be the Apple mobile timepiece management protocol. But while I still hold out hope for that, even though I still don't have a watch of my own, I now think we're moving towards mobile mobility management. <laughs> That's right. With Apple reportedly working on some sort of car project, the need for skilled mobile mobility management is likely to be in high demand. <laughs> Especially with, ground breaking, with a groundbreaking vehicle that has the possibility of learning with deep skepticism and IAPs. Yeah, that's in automobile purchases. <laughs> Since we're coming from Southeast Pennsylvania, we are close enough to have gotten to the secret trials at Dover Speedway. And as you can see, this kind of car and this artist's rendition could be great. <laughs> this is, of course, is the stock model. <laughs> <laughs> Apple can clearly use its expertise in retail to completely remake the car buying experience. It's a local place. Uh, but we're not here to talk about the nearly certain future. Let's talk to about today and the real topic. I've spoken with several Mac admins who are uncomfortable with configuration profiles. It can be due to the fear, uncertainty, and doubt of rolling out a new technology to replace something older and uh, something that works, like defaults or MCX or changes to the user template. But this has been Apple's direction for some time, so there's a good chance that not adopting them will be, it'll lead to missing out. And there's no time, like now, to dive into profiles. This is an actual dive, not simulated. <laughs> <laughs> it's understandable that it would be daunting to take that plunge. We've moved from simpler workflows like defaults right to a $20 web app, a directory service, and a push notification infrastructure just to do the same thing. Preference management on the Mac has progressed from a property list at 51 bytes up to a default script at 75 bytes, all the way up to 1,540 bytes for a configuration profile to do the same thing. Now that's progress in just 15 years. <laughs> to help us figure out how we got here, we sought to break down configuration profiles. So we thought of Liam, the iPhone disassembly robot that Apple recently revealed 
and it seemed like a great example to follow for this presentation because we want to do disassembly here. So I'm here to reveal our creation, Profilum, the Profile Disassembly Robot. Do you want to see a video? Yeah. Yeah. All right. There's a white room. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only backdrop I had. Having disassembled a profile, it's time to get into more detail about implementing and organizing them. Our topics for the moment will include the balance of how many profiles to use, some key concepts about the structure of profile property lists, and the use of profiles in your MDM or as external files, the latter of which relates to Monkey. When first starting out with profiles, you may be encouraged by the interface of the profile editor to create one large profile. Manage all the things at once. <laughs> yeah, you bet, definitely. You may feel it is more appropriate to make lots of little profiles. Manage one of the things, maybe. <laughs> Your balance may end up being somewhere in the middle, and Manage there may some be of the things. <laughs> Sometimes and there may be cases <laughs> that always goes up an extra slide. Anyway, we think you will want to have more than one profile. You'll want to be somewhere in that middle because it could good, be good to plan for as many as you might make. With more individual profiles, you can better adapt for exceptions. And we all know that that's where the problems lie, exceptions to the policies. To try to help determine how many profiles you might want to support, it is helpful to know more about the key value structure of the profile format. The payload identifier is the unique identifier used by the operating system when determining if a profile is installed or not installed. So it's very important. It's the most critical thing. The file name of a profile, if it is saved to a file, can be something different or related. I like to make them related. Apple documents that identifier as a reverse DNS style identifier, similar to what we've seen for preference domains and other aspects of OS X or Mac OS. This can be helpful for organizational purposes, especially if you follow the, the same pattern for file names. However, the identifier needs to only be a string of unique characters that isn't repeated across all of the profiles that you create and use. Try to think about what would make your profile future-proof as well, because when you create an identifier and then have to change it later, it becomes a new profile for all intents and purposes. I have personal experience with this. If you have a runbook or a guide to how you are configuring your systems, you may want to use the identifier to be a reference back to that documentation, especially if you don't think it will ever change. Here's an example of a reverse DNS name with a com.example domain. And you may want to put system or device into the profile name to separate it out from user profiles and use user in that case. Perhaps you want to trace the profile back to the <coughs> section in your profile editor like restrictions and be more specific about what part of the section you're managing. In this case, restrictions app store. Finally, this profile implements the Center for Internet Security's OS 10 baseline from section 1.1. This is one example, but consider coming up with your own naming convention to help organize your profiles, especially if they will be stored on disk. If you want to, you can use it a different kind of format, like Safari settings, as long as you remain consistent and keep your profiles unique. The payload UUID seems important. It is, after all, a 128-bit number. But it does not appear to play a critical role in managing OS X. The display name, however, as a friendly name, is the first key that you'll notice appearing in the profile's system preference pane and so it may be visible to your users if you allow them to see that, that preference pane. These three keys are also visible on the profile system preference pane. 
The organization field is the name of your business, school, or organization. The description is the chance to summarize the profile settings. Use it as a way to link back to your documentation as well. If the profile has a signature that can be successfully tied back to a trusted certificate authority, it will also show up as verified. Otherwise, it will list as not verified. One last top-level key of interest is the payload version. It can be easy to confuse this with a version of your profile payload, but instead, it's really the version number of the profile format. It should always be one. Again, I speak from experience. Profiles organized with an MDM, like Profile Manager or JSS, combine the editor and the organizer together. The interface generally follows that of Profile Manager with additions by the specific vendor. An MDM may have limited organization options because of that. Category and scoping may be the extent. Importing a profile into an MDM can make it appear as a custom configuration. This may not be editable. It's not a reason not to do it, just a warning. It's worth considering exporting from an MDM. This can let you archive profiles or versions of specific profiles as you change them over time for reference later. When this happens, the profiles may be signed. And to decode a signed profile, use this security command. You should supply the path to the profile on disk and then redirect the output to a new file. That brings us to handcrafted profiles. Made from the finest bits harvested in the digital fields by hipsters in Berkeley. <laughs> they, these can often start in the same editor you use, like Profile Manager. They can be the actual live preferences, the MCX or property lists that are migrated to profiles with the excellent MCX to profile tool. I expect there's a ding in Slack right now. Um, there can also, they can also be programmatically created using tools like Puppet or Chef. A new one to watch out for is Profile Creator from Eric Berglund. As external files, they can be edited in a text editor or a property list editor, whatever your choice is. An exported profile often appears as one very long line in a text editor. Use the plutil convert command to go from one long line to formatted lines. This reformats the profile. Specifying the path only once re, uh, sends everything right back to the same file. When viewing or editing a profile within an editor, there is a general structure. There is the overall profile with the keys covered earlier and one or more payloads that are contained within that. A payload can correspond to a section in Profile Manager, be split across multiple sections of Profile Manager, or contain custom settings for one or more applications. When deconstructing that kind of profile to create more modular individual profiles that you can use with uh, lots of different kinds of exception situations, focus on a single payload or a small number of payloads. For example, within the full set of payloads, remove all but the top level keys and a single payload, and then do your editing within that, that uh, single payload to j get just the keys and values that you want. There are many examples of where something like this has been done, especially on GitHub. So I encourage you to search around. We have some references for that at the end. It can also pay to check for errors in a profile, again, speaking from experience, since that can prevent successful deployment and the ability to import it back into an MDM. The plutil lint command is great for this, as well as other things like um, you know, monkey packages info. Um, the xml lint command is a more general purpose option for XML files. It also works in this case. Malformed profiles can produce all sorts of errors, and I generated a few just for you. I have a lot more of those. We, tried, we had a whole section we got rid of about minimum viable profiles. <laughs> it's kind of strange. Um, so whether you use an MDM or start with external files, it can be helpful to have the external files and place them under version control. By doing this, you can tell when a profile has been modified, which can be an important audit function. And you can track changes between versions to see how they have changed over time. A repository can provide a way to distribute responsibility for creating and maintaining profiles between several people, if you have a team. 
And if something unfortunate happens, version control can help uncover who did what and when. It's always me. <laughs> I'm the, the most responsible person, I guess. Um, so when you're creating a repository, um, in this case, I'm going to uh, change into a re repo directory and then use the git init command to make a configuration profiles repository inside that uh, folder. Once I do that, I add a configuration profile. I can do that in the finder if I want to. And then I move into that directory. I use git status. And I see that there is a changed file, an, ad an added file. And now I'm going to add that to the history in git, so git add, uh, and then commit that change with the git commit command. So it's a, a pretty good cycle, and there are other tools you can use to do this kind of thing, uh, GUI, GUI tools that use Git. Uh, so I encourage you, if you want to keep track of these things, to look into that. Another common use of flat configuration profiles is with Monkey. When importing a profile into Monkey, it does not need to be packaged. The default name is the file name for the profile, so keep them unique and descriptive. Monkey installs profiles as root, so it installs device or system level profiles only. Profiles can be linked to other Monkey objects using the requires and update for relationships. This can tie managed preferences together with a deployed application. And with that, that's over to you. So uh, I know some of you um, probably work in Active Directory shops uh, where um, Mac is a minority citizen in such networks. And there's usually lots of services and um, uh, internal websites that leverage that uh, to provide services for the users, for your employees. So um, in order to take advantage of that, you'll want to have the certs that everything um, <coughs> Uh, trusts against into your system. So one way we can do that is through profiles. And <coughs> you do that because uh, with profiles, uh, the uh, CA certs that you install are automatically trusted on the internal network. Uh, so you don't have to fool around with uh, the security command to import the cert and then make sure you set the proper trust settings. It just happens <coughs> automatically. And having a single file where you keep all the certs makes it a little easier for you to update it if it needs to be updated for like example when a uh, cert, like an issuing s server cert has expired or a intermediate cert has expired, you just replace the cert and um, update the profile and push it out all to your machines with very little fuss or muss. So let's take a look at the profile. This one is one of the simpler ones because you're only using the certificate payload. And <coughs> however, you have to use Profile Manager or similar, something like the JSS or uh, When It Drops Profile Creator by Eric Berglund uh, to create the actual profile. Um, there's no command line utility to do that. Uh, the Profile Manager will also accept PEM and other formats, including .sir and others. Uh, but if you use the JSS, it will not accept the .pem. And as I mentioned, certs installed by the profile are automatically trusted by the OS. So what does that look like behind the scenes? So up here, you'll see where it says uh, the payload type. And you see it's like security and dot root, which means it's trusted by the system automatically. And down here, you'll see the cert as is encoded, which I think is base64, which is probably one of the reasons why there's no <coughs> command line tools for that yet. So, and here's a little peek at the JSS for when you're setting it up. Um, and <coughs> here's where the certificates, and it's pretty simple. You just click the upload certificate button, and you get the uh, file chooser, choose file, you select your certificate, and hit choose. And, oops, doesn't like the PEM. All right, so we're gonna have to convert the PEM to uh, dot cert. So you can do this using keychain access. It's pretty straightforward. Or uh, you can just go right to using the open SSL command, whichever you prefer. 
So OpenSSL, there you go. That's uh, from on which the pretty straightforward way to converting that. So, um, and in Keychain Access, it's also pretty straightforward. You uh, just basically go to File, Export Items. Once you select the cert, it automatically wants to save it out as a .cert. So you hit Save, and then you go back to your JSS, hit the, select the cert in the cert format now, and now it's in your JSS as a profile. And from here, you save it and uh, deploy it as you would anything else. <coughs> So a couple of things. Uh, since uh, you have an MDM, presumably, uh, you can use uh, that to push it out. And uh, it's pretty straightforward once you set it up. And uh, it goes out via APNS. And uh, within a few minutes, you can have your entire fleet uh, updated with this profile, everything trusted, and everybody's happy. Um, you can also deploy it via package. Um, and uh, you can roll your own uh, installer or you use the Make Profile Package tool by Tim Sutton, uh, which makes it a lot easier than you having to actually go make the package, add the script, and all that stuff. The Make Profile Package takes care of that for you. Um, <coughs> and you can also, instead of pushing, you can do a pull in self-service if you're a Casper person. It's a, it's a workflow already set up there. And what that does is it shows up in self-service. They click. Uh, install and it pull, in, pulls it down and installs the profile and from there they can either manage it either to remove it later if you've set that out or uh, not it's there permanently uh, and monkey handles system certs system or device certs so all you have to do is just add the profile itself and uh, or you can use whatever other package method deployment you want ARD sneaker net that's up to you so building on that, we can do things like user certificate authentication for wireless. So, and why would we want to do that? One reason, uh, we want to increase the security of our network by reducing the number of times user passwords are sent across the network. So the less passwords going across the network, the less chance of somebody who's uh, somebody bad who's already on the network can intercept that traffic and then maybe pick out uh, somebody else's password that maybe is a domain admin and do more bad things from there. And from a user experience point of view, we're removing a potential lockout vector by not storing the user password in the login keychain, uh, which means uh, you get less calls about lockouts uh, because their password, once their password changed. So there are probably more, but those were at least two of our considerations when doing this. So let's take a look at this profile. It'll have a network payload and an AD certificate payload. So the network payload, as configured, we've enabled auto-join, uh, again, as more of a user experience consideration so that the user doesn't have to always connect to the network. Um, we have set TLS as the only accepted EAP type, mainly because this is pretty much the only way it works. You can't have another EAP type set with TLS. And we're setting the security type to WPA, WPA2 Enterprise. Um, it, depending on how your network is configured, uh, your mileage may vary, so check on that. And we're going to set the identity certificate to AD certificate. Um, in this example, uh, you actually have to set the AD certificate first, so uh, it becomes available as in, uh, in the network payload option, but for this demonstration purposes, I'm going to assume we already have it set. And You'll have the option to set it as a login window profile, but once we've saved everything, that option goes away in the GUI. Um, and uh, if you have File Vault 2, it wouldn't have mattered anyway, because File Vault 2 skips the login window process. So uh, for the most part, this network join happens post login, as far as I can tell. So what does this look like? And I have uh, my JSS up here. So, and we'll highlight some things. So, there's the auto join. There's the security type. And uh, the login window option, which will go away after you save. And that's where you set the accepted EAP types and the identity circuit. So, behind the scenes, and you see a couple of uh, booleans up there, and the encryption types, and the EAP configuration. So, 
um, the AD cert payload. So uh, we talked about that earlier, and um, one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, usually when you're working with AD networks, you have a bunch of AD admins, uh, and uh, they like to make things easier for themselves as well, and usually just assume that everything that's not Windows uh, can handle Windows stuff. So sometimes they'll send you a uh, cert bundle, like a P7B file. One of the things you want to be watch out for is that the P7B file, if you use keychain access, will not always see every certificate in the chain, uh, as I found out much to my chagrin. So um, the best thing you want to do there is then maybe convert the P7B to either .pem or .sir and look at it as uh, text, and then pull out all the certs there and uh, put them out individually. Uh, using the other uh, profile that I talked about earlier. So, um, <coughs> so yeah, so you want to make sure you have all the certs in your chain before you start testing this, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. So, and that's why I said there. So, uh, yeah, so you want to be have it all installed, including the issuing certificate server, which is the one I was missing, which is why I was having a bad time for a long time. So once the CA chain is in place, um, basically because of the magic of Microsoft, everything should just work at that point. <laughs> so when you're setting up the AD cert, you'll have the option to use a, the, the default user uh, profile, but normally in those circumstances, your AD admins will probably have made some sort of change or tweak and either just renamed it because uh, standard operating procedure for Windows admins never use anything that's default. Um, so uh, <coughs> if you have something like that, uh, or if you have Windows devices or iOS devices that are already using user certificate authentication, you can probably use the same user cert template for that and it should just work. So another consideration now is that the uh, payload now uses RPC for requests. So you're only going to have to use the server FQDN in, uh, in that field. Uh, earlier versions required uh, the, an URL, and uh, so essentially the payload was making a, uh, uh, a web request for the cert. So what does this look like? So yeah, there's your FQDN, your uh, the display name, and you have to be very careful about how <coughs> all these things are um, uh, entered because uh, if it's spelled wrong, it's not going to work. So it's like a very fragile sort of thing, but once everything is set cor correctly, it does work. And there's, I'm using the default user template here. And the prompt for credentials, which uh, changes the game for deployment in a minute uh, that I'll talk about in a minute. So, <coughs> and here's what that looks like behind the scenes. Pretty straightforward. So as configured with the prompt for user credentials, this profile cannot be pushed normally by the M your MDM or APNS. Um, so uh, this is one of the things that you have to deploy by package. Uh, and again, roll your own or use make profile package to make your life easier. And um, what you can do, though, is that if you have Casper and you have this profile installed, you can use self-service to have your users pull it, which is certainly an option, and that installs automatically, no user prompts. If you uh, give this profile to your users in some other way, like you email it to them or have them grab it from a website, uh, and they double click on it through the normal profile procedures, then they will get prompted to enter in a bunch of information. So, the, one of the things we have to keep in mind is if we're gonna push this profile out because it's a user profile, uh, it has to be run as the user in user space. Uh, so you can't automatically just uh, install the package like you would any other package from there. So we recommend using Outset uh, by Joe Chilcoat and or something similar uh, to install this profile. Uh, or if you're feeling up to it, you can make your own launch agent to create the pro to install the profile. 
And for us, and this is one of another gotchas that I found out, is that if you are migrating from another profile that sets up your wireless network, like that uses username and password authentication, for example, then you're going to have to remove the safe password from the user's login keychain. Uh, that ends up confusing um, uh, the system and prompts the user to pick between either user cert or uh, the old password authentication. So uh, we don't want that. So another consideration is that you also want to remove the older profile. If you have uh, Casper, you'll actually have to uh, create a way to do that. Um, and uh, you can use extension attribute and smart group combination for this. The extension attribute, the one I have, looks for the uh, profile ID. And then uh, just, just simply true or false, whether it's installed or not. And um, you can set up a smart group so that when uh, the machine enters the smart group because the extension attribute ran and ticked a flag, then uh, it automatically pulls the, uh, uh, the machine out uh, from that profile group uh, once you set it up to exclusion, and that will automate the removal. So um, any monkey users will just probably have to uh, adjust their managed uninstalls so that gets done automatically. So um, I have a couple of uh, example scripts up here, and uh, you'll have these slides so you can always check them out. Uh, pull request accepted, but uh, for example of uh, deployment script and for extension attribute, you can check those out. And uh, now Jeremy will talk about more stuff. Thanks, Serge. So removing profiles is also an important thing that we may need, to, may need to do, especially if we need to make changes to them because of the pro payload identifier or something like that. So sometimes we have planned removals, like the kind uh, that S Serge just talked about. Uh, that which may be uh, uh, done with your MDM or with a monkey managed uninstall. In some scenarios, though, you might want the removal to be part of the profile itself. And this is something that, that uh, is a little bit different. So there are two keys in profiles that let you do this. The first is the removal date. It's an absolute date in coordinated universal time when the profile will be removed. So the system just handles this. The duration until removal is a number of seconds before removal. Seconds from when? From the time it's installed. This is an example of the removal date in the profile manager. So that's the code and the, uh, the user interface. So in this particular case, if I got my date math right, it will be removed at 9 p.m. on a particular day. And then we have the duration until removal, which is called the interval in Profile Manager. And this corresponds to that three-hour time, hopefully. You're probably going to you know, do the math and put that in Slack or in the Google Doc or something and say, oh, Jeremy, get messed this. <laughs> So this could be used in situations where you might want to deploy network settings at s initial setup, but you need to remove those initial network settings after deployment. You may have certain situations where you're on a special network during deployment but don't need those other places. Uh, so you might want to have a short duration profile. Uh, so let's see what that looks like. I've got a video here. It's not live. You can see we're counting down the time. Five. But wait a minute. This seems like the perfect opportunity for audience participation. <laughs> you thought you could just go to sleep, didn't you? <laughs> no. So I want you to all count down with me. All right? So we'll do this over again. We have a few seconds to prepare. OK? So here we go again. Let's watch for the, the right time, 55 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year! And finally, it gets removed. And you'll notice that it's hunting for the network like we've all been doing this week. <laughs> I know it's a cheap shot. 
Um, but this is, a, this is something you could actually deploy uh, in a deployment situation where you need to retract those kinds of network settings later. So sometimes we just need to control applications. We need to do, uh, change some settings, maybe stop the startup behavior, and we'll do this with iBooks as a demonstration. So the startup behavior of iBooks throws up a bunch of screens that we want to get rid of. And I've also found that there's this interesting little bit of data leak that we could prevent uh, with the bookmark sync, bookmarks and notes. So if you're in an organization that is paranoid like that, you may want to turn that off. So how do we do that? Take a look to find existing profile settings because it's an Apple application, right, Serge? Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's got to have something in profile. Got to be in there somewhere. Yeah. So we'll take a look in profile manager. Somewhere. Look through all these sections. I'll pretend to do this live. <laughs> Even though there's Keynote all around it. <laughs> but no, I, I don't see iBooks. I don't even see anything for Apple applications. Hmm. Weird. Yeah. Unfortunate. So there's no iBook profile settings. <laughs> I, guess, I guess we can't do this. But. Time to go home. Yep. So instead, we're going to find the existing preferences. And we've all done this kind of thing before, I'm sure, or, or heard about it. Uh, so we'll make a change in the app and see what preferences change. And we have to do that knowing about CF Press D and how it caches preferences. And the preferences are not necessarily written to disk right away. But finding the preferences on disk is one way to, uh, to look for the changes. So we'll do that. First, let's, let's look at that startup behavior that we want to prevent. iBook, getting started, don't want to sign in. OK. And we also want to look at those preferences slowly. And we want to turn off that sync bookmark setting. So now that we've made that change in real time, <laughs> Uh, we'll look for preferences in the typical kinds of folders where, the, where we would see preferences. And in this case, I'll sort the preferences folders, the home, fo hold, home preferences folder for the user and uh, the systems preferences folder uh, by date with the T command, or uh, T flag on LS. And we would expect to see something like this, a path like this. Pretty common path for a preference file. Take a look. See if we can find that. Pretend to type. <laughs> and look for the last five changes with the head command, typing that to the head command. Do that in both folders. And we do notice there is an iBooks X uh, secure plist file. Uh, but you'll just have to trust me that that one doesn't contain the preferences we want. <coughs> uh, that footage got cut on, the, is on the cutting room floor. Um, so we just can't use this particular file. Thinking about this, though, we realized that iBooks is sandboxed. Apple. All that security, all that privacy. Mm -hmm. So the sandbox for the iBooks application is in the uh, library containers folder of the user account. And there is a preference file there, happily enough. Let's take a look at what's in that preference file. Type com.apple a couple of times. You have to repeat that a lot with containers. Do some autocomplete. And there is the preference file for the application in its container. And there are some settings here that we can use. So we can use MCX to profile ding, uh, and call uh, that particular file, the I, uh, iBooks preference file, using the plist uh, flag and use the identifier of iBooks DLP. Now, I talked to you about doing the reverse DNS uh, style identifier. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm making a quick profile, I just do something short so that I can get it done. Can always modify this later. But that's going to output to uh, uh, 
a profile to that identifier, and I'm going to find some of the key preferences, and I'm going to focus on these. I've removed a lot of all of the other preferences uh, from this example, and these three keys control that startup experience and the profile or the uh, bookmark sync preference. So, going to apply that to the computer. Can never type a password right the first time. <laughs> can anybody? I can always get to the right spot in the date and time system preferences. You know, the right city, but <laughs> never the password. <laughs> Try to turn on sync bookmarks. And notice how it keeps getting turned back off, because now it's a forced setting, even though it's not grayed out. So just to show that that, that wasn't a fluke, we'll look for iBooks with Spotlight and Try it again, reopen the application, and now uh, we have tested this. So that's something really important. Once you create a, a profile, especially a custom profile, make sure you test, test, test. I always recommend also to test. <laughs> we should test, yes. And now we will move on to controlling gatekeeper settings. Uh, the gatekeeper is one of the built-in payloads we found, so I'm just going to go and try to look for it in the uh, profile manager. Look for the right section. It's in there somewhere. It's got to be here. Mm. You're realizing this is the same video, right? <laughs> <laughs> you think I, I wouldn't take it twice? It did take two takes, though. But no, it's not there, it, or it is there this time, sorry. Yeah, it's just not listed under gatekeeper. That was the trick. Uh, it's under security and privacy, so it's like the listing in the security system preference pane. And interestingly, I'm looking at a user profile here, um, and I have uh, only one setting. Do not allow the override, but I want to, change the choice so I can only have Mac App Store apps run, because that's extremely useful. <laughs> well, it turns out you have to enable device management and profile manager to get to that point. So uh, once I change to device management, I can see this option. And I have all of the choices. And here is a comparison between the device and device groups and users and groups in profile manager. It's important to note that other MDMs may behave separately. For example, JSS assumes that all profiles are device level and shows options for that. This profile now allows for all three states as a, as a device profile. So let's take a look at what that appears like in the uh, property list. When we enable assessment, that makes it so that we turn off the Anywhere setting, so that limits us to the top two choices, Mac App Store or that plus identified developers. And the Disable Override uh, is the checkbox corresponds to uh, true uh, in another payload, another part of the payload. So if we apply that profile and then try to confirm it with the SPCTL command with the status and verbose flags, it does say that, that assess assessments are enabled and developer ID is disabled. So this means that we have a very useful computer which can only run the Apple apps and the App Store apps. And then we realize that that's not really working out for us. So we want to change, make a new profile, change this profile rather, uh, and change it back to Mac App Store and identify developers so we're back to the default that comes with the OS. That changes the allowed identified developers to true and disable override to false. Apply that profile and check SPCTL. And now we see assessments are still enabled, which is good. We want that on. And developer ID is also enabled, which will allow the, uh, uh, the non-app store developer ID enabled apps to run. In system preferences, this looks like this. Zoom in and we can see what choice we're on and it's grayed out because now it's managed, which is a little bit of a difference from the default for the OS. We also know that there's a way we can manage this from the command line rather than from a profile. So 
Whether you want to use a profile or not is up to you, but bear this in mind, if you use the enable or disable commands, they have some special features. If I go through and turn off assessments with the master disable, and then check the status again, I find that assessments are disabled. Doesn't matter about developer ID anymore because the assessments are completely disabled. This is now the anywhere section, or anywhere setting. And profiles dash C, uh, capital C, shows that there's still a profile installed. Sounds like a bug. Yeah. The command line tool overrides the profile. And in researching this, I found out that the system administration commands run as root, according to Apple, can override your profiles. So you do want to make sure you test this kind of scenario if you know that there's a command line tool that also controls the same function. With that, I've searched for another example. So uh, um, some of you may have heard about um, the Sparkle update framework vulnerability. So um, I was looking to um, provide a solution for that for our users, uh, um, but I didn't want to do it, go into depth and try to figure out um, what is and isn't installed. And um, because we give our users a certain amount of freedom, so I'm only managing our standard apps and uh, users can then install apps that they need for their job or for whatever uh, as well. Um, so I wanted to figure out a way so um, we can uh, disable the frame any vulnerable apps from hitting up uh, their Sparkle framework and uh, do it in an auto magic way. <laughs> well, as George Maui said, because it's there. You know, can it actually be done? Let's find out. And as I mentioned, this would also eliminate the need for me to curate and uh, create and curate a large list of vulnerable apps. And uh, we have about uh, 4,000 uh, Macs deployed in our environment, so uh, I didn't really want to get into that. So how would we do this? Well, first we'll need to identify and list all the vulnerable apps. Uh, we'll need to generate a profile for each app. And then we'll need to sign each uh, profile. And then finally, install each profile. So uh, I immediately uh, went to uh, Adam and started my bash script. Uh, because all I have is a hammer. <laughs> so, and there's a couple of considerations before I had to start. Um, uh, basically, uh, all three of those Python scripts will need to be installed locally, and they're passed referenced in the script. Uh, and those scripts could be packaged up and deployed separately to either private.temp or if you're managing, if you have a managed location where you put scripts for either users or for some system, system tools that you use, you can put them there. So the other thing I needed to consider was that the signing cert identity that I use may need an intermediate or root cert installed as well. And this can be done by either uh, pushing out a profile or as we discussed earlier, or as a package, that's up to you. And uh, because I'm a Jamf guy, I'm leveraging the JSS and the Jamf binary to basically call some of these things in the script as well. Um, but if the logic behind it can be easily adapted for uh, either Monkey, LanRev, or whatever you're using currently. So uh, what would this look like? Well, I made a little <coughs> video. Um, keep in mind that this is a work in progress, uh, but uh, this is what it would look like. On the right, you'll see uh, the script and its output logs. And on the left, you'll see um, the working directory and what's happening inside. And here's the first wrinkle. This is when we come to actually signing the profile. And this is done in user space. So you see where I've run into the first problem. So thank God there's only three vulnerable apps on this machine. All right, well, let's, before we get into the problem, let's take a look about what's happening behind the scenes here. So as I mentioned, uh, we're identifying and listing the vulnerable apps, and I'm using Sparkle MTITM vulnerable apps that Ben, ben Toms wrote, uh, also known as Mac Mule. So that quickly identifies the vulnerable apps, and he initially wrote it as a Casper extension attribute, 
which means that his output is wrapped in uh, the results XML tags, which we'll need to deal with at some point. And when it outputs, it outputs both the path to the application and the application or bundle IDs, which we're going to use to feed to the next step, which is creating the profile to block this, the updater. And for to do that, I'm using Extinguish PI, written by Alistair Banks, because he's the one who made that happen. Uh, and this is the actual exact tool for the job. So what that does is that it uh, sets the URL on the unpatched Sparkle updaters to home, 127.0.0.1. And uh, you're going to use the .a flag to feed in the Apple app, app ident bundle identifiers. And it generates dynamically an unsigned profile. So which brings us to the next step, signing the profile. So uh, I'm using the Profile Signer by Nix McSpadden. And um, you can use the security man to sign profiles, but Profile Signer actually simplifies the process so you're not digging into the arcana of, of uh, security commands. And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of stuff in security that can trip you up. And Nick so McSpadden is also known as Nick McSpadden. So yes, that's true. Just the same name. Did I spell his name wrong? Is that no, no, no. I'm okay. Poor <laughs> my poor attempt at another joke. <laughs> so, so as as we noticed, uh, it, you can actually sign silently sign uh, the profiles because the user gets prompted when you do. So uh, that's a uh, particular roadblock that I haven't actually overcome yet. Um, if anybody has an ideas, accept pull requests. Um, and as we know, this is working as intended. Um, I did hear that it's probably possible from a few sources, but I haven't had time to check that out. Uh, and of course, lastly, we have to install the profile. This is done simply by using the profiles command. Uh, the dash i is to install, and dash f is the path to the profile. Uh, there is more to the profiles command. You can just do man profiles to see what, uh, what's all in there. So other things that I had to have in the script include a uh, get signing cert function. So this is uh, basically goes out and grabs the uh, signing cert and any intermediate cert and installs that locally if it's not present on the machine. Uh, I also have the ver verify signing cert uh, function, which go basically makes that's actually what checks to see if, if the signing cert's on the machine locally, and if not, it triggers the other function to grab it. And of course, cleanup. Uh, we want to remove all those uh, mobile config files and pull out the uh, signing cert identity because we don't want to keep it locally on the machine. So uh, what that looks like in, uh, <coughs> in my actual script. So uh, particularly, this is the actual function. Uh, I'm using awk to, uh, uh, with the default, uh, with the delimiter set to dash so I can grab uh, the whole app identity afterwards. And that said command, using the regular expression magic to uh, strip out the XML tags. And yes, Alistair, he knows he used awk and said. Yes, yes, yes. I, if you can't tell, he's judging me silently from wherever he is. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and this is the extinguish command, uh, the dash O and dash P. So you want to make sure you use your own organization identifiers. Um, and these are mine, obviously. Uh, and finally, uh, the signing. So what I did is the, um, in the profiles that Extinguish gathered, I just stripped the mobile config extension at the end so I can reuse the name and append dot signed. And then when we move to install them, um, <coughs> that gets installed, uh, the right profiles in that sense. So this is the shameless plug section of our talk. So as I mentioned before, both Jeremy and I are from Greater Philadelphia Mac Admins. We have a bunch of you here. Uh, those of you from the Philly area, uh, if you want to come check, it, check us out, we uh, meet up uh, once every month, usually in a couple different locations. Uh, but only, <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, yes, I, yes, see? Who what has a camera, camera? We have, we have summoned Alistair. We have invoked his name. But, um, so anyway. 
So yeah, so we have a website. You can check us out on the Facebooks and the Twitters, and uh, we hang out in the Philly channel, the Mac Admin Slack. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we researched and looked into when preparing for this talk. Uh, so and flip through it really quickly so they yes, can see it. So yeah, so it's like all this stuff here. So we just put all these links, um, and uh, like we put links to all the things, all the uh, open source uh, uh, applications that we referenced and um, uh, and some here, that we didn't and some that we didn't uh, and also we have uh, Greg's talks and slides in here because you they know, were very good and inspirational yes, yes and depressing when we found out we had the same topic right yes <laughs> so and there's like a whole other different scenarios and gotchas you have to watch out for profiles that we didn't get to cover as well um, and as I said we have all these links so uh, the slides will be available. Um, uh, we'll post these up, so they'll be available, I think, uh, later this afternoon or on Friday. So uh, you can go those, go, go, ah, go grab those and uh, check them out for yourself. So, and I guess now it's time to throw the box. So we will take questions now, and we may even have answers for you. And if you have answers, we'd love to have them too. So mm -hmm. thank you for coming today. Okay, who has questions? Don't everybody raise your hand at once. <laughs> I usually throw a Frisbee, so that's a little difficult for me. When you are going through doing the uh, wireless configurations, is there a way to pass the user's uh, logon credentials if they're using their Active Directory username and password? There, there should be. Uh, it's not something I tested, but you can uncheck uh, prompt user for authentication, and you should be able to use uh, the variables. Like for the JSS, it's percent sign, username, percent sign. Uh, I don't know what it is for um, a profile manager, but something you might be able to pass the user variable, and then that should grab it from the logged in user, and then that will probably most likely prompt them to enter their password the first time. And those kinds of variables are injected by the MDM on the way through, as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. So it's not something you can use with a, a, a flash profile. Oh, there's our home. There's our home. Sorry, 2009 Max. So, <laughs> so who, has, who has a question? I saw a hand up over there somewhere. You want to throw it throw over that there. out? Throw it over there. It's fun. Try it. Throw it up, though. All right. There we go. I saw somebody the, in the last session. The example you gave where the profile was ignored after you used the command line? Yes. Is there a way to get that to back to a known state? Like if you delete the profile, reapply it, does that work? Or? Um, pretty much you're going to have to uninstall the profile and then reapply it to get it to remanage once again. But that will override the command line in yes. you yeah. made earlier. Yes, if you're, if, but if, if you your users are admins, though, that's something that uh, they may be able to override. Yeah, they basically fight against each other. So if you're doing any sort of inventory collection, you're going to want to use whatever tools are available to collect the current actual state uh, so that you know what to apply and what not to apply. Anybody uh, else have any questions? So just as a note on that, um, no. the, the profile um, is not automatically reinstalled or reinforced at startup. Uh, log out, log in. I tested those scenarios. So, so any more questions? You know, we'll take questions on anything. <laughs> All right, thank Requests. you. Requests. So please do, please do to make sure to fill out the feedback so uh, we can get better at this, especially me since I'm a noob. And uh, thank you, Penn State, for having us. Uh, thank, you. thank you for coming out to this convention, uh, this conference. Let's have and a let's have a round of applause for the conference. Too. Yes.